All righty. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today um, for our, our ultrasound lecture series. Um, I am really excited about today. Um, we have a guest speaker, um, so a friend of our program, uh, Siddharth Duger, who's over at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, he's an intensivist over there, and he's the director of their point of care ultrasound division um, in their intensive care unit. So Sid and I have, um, we've uh, gone back a couple of years. We've taught together, um, particularly with, you know, critical care fellows. Um, and so he is a, um, a, a genius when it comes to ultrasound. I'm excited to hear uh, his approach to basic um, critical care echocardiography and kind of how he, uh, how do he protocolize that in the ICU. So without my further rambling, Sid, go ahead and take it away. Um, and thanks for joining us and being with us today. Thank you, thank you so much, Matt. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I think it's already good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the, uh, the lecture. So uh, my name is Siddhar Dugar. I'm one of the staff physician at Cleveland Clinic. I lead the point of care ultrasound program um, at the, for Respiratory Institute. And I'm so happy to be here and talk about the protocolized approach. So I will just try to uh, start with first is like, I have no conflict of interest. Um, none whatsoever. Uh, you know, like where was this idea born about using a protocolized approach? I know everybody is like, you know, a uh, point of care ultrasound is more of a physical examination. But again, if we go back to the medical school, we were taught about doing a physical examination in certain format, like your ear inspection, your palpation, your percussion and auscultation. Same way we thought that, you know, it will be good to just make it out there that uh, when you're doing a point of care ultrasound or echocardiography, you have to be sure that you are able to uh, acquire all the images and interpret it in a way that you can rule out or rule in all the causes of shock, uh, all the causes of echo-based shock that your patient may have. So before, before I delve into the, uh, the, the protocol, let's just talk about what is critical care ultrasonography or echocardiography. So the most important thing is that it's, it's performed by the bedside physician. The person who has examined the patient, who has talked with the patient, who knows what's going on with the patient, who has a clinical gestalt that, you know, this is what may be wrong with my patient. And he's the one who is performing the ultrasound. So that, that is where the focus starts. Um, it's very limited. It's focus examination. Now the, the, the word focus keeps expanding as I do more and more ultrasound. What is part of this? Uh, uh, the what is like you know a focus examination, but for the sake of this lecture, I will just stick to the basic echocardiographic um, examination. It has to be goal directed. You have to have a clinical question that you are trying to answer. The good thing about point of care ultrasound is that it's not just pertaining to one organ. You can just move from one organ to another organ and try to put together a cohesive image of what's going on with the patient. And definitely, it should be done to answer a specific clinical question that can guide your care. Um, how is it different from a normal process? So when, uh, when you have a patient who has shock, you will be thinking, okay, maybe this is, you know, uh, a sepsis, or maybe that there is an infection, there may be a pulmonary embolism, um, and you will order all the tests uh, that will be performed by a technician or by a resident or a fellow. Um, the results will be interpreted by the radiologist, cardiologist, who may not know more all, all the things that you are thinking about the patient. The, there are a lot of problems that happens with the, with the normal way that we are doing stuff right now. First of all, uh, it, it may not be available at night and weekend. Okay, let's say like you, you have a patient who is coming in and you're concerned about DVT, but there is no tech available at night. So you have to wait for the next day. The problem with that is that the condition might worsen or might resolve. And if it resolves, that's great. But if it worsens, then we just missed those golden hours where we could have provided uh, better care to the patient. Just like how when you are at bedside and you are, have a clinical question, you perform a physical examination. Similarly, point of care ultrasound is basically an extension of your physical examination. What are the goals of focus? The goals of focus is to narrow a differential diagnosis. So I like this image a lot just because it shows that if you have your HNP, your physical examination and all the monitoring and labs, you are, uh, and this is your diagnosis, focus might get you closer to the diagnosis. You know, it may not give you the diagnosis, but you will be able to rule out a few things and you may be able to rule in a few things. So the role, the role of point of care ultrasound or echocardiography that I see in management of shock is to narrow down the differential diagnosis. 
if you find a diagnosis, you can increase the diagnostic accuracy. So if you have a patient that you're worried about, uh, about pulmonary embolism, and you do a DVT scan and you find a clot in the leg, then your diagnostic accuracy that your initial hypothesis that the patient may have a pulmonary embolism, which may be the cause of the shock in this patient, becomes um, you are more confident about your diagnosis. And I use uh, ultrasound a lot to monitor my response to intervention, be it fluid loading, be it um, you know looking at changes in uh, uh, in the stroke volume with all the interventions that I do. I just want to reiterate here uh, that you know it's not an alter alternative to a comprehensive examination. Um, I will still recommend if your clinical question is not answered with point of care ultrasound or you're not confident, just make sure that you get a comprehensive examination order. Um, just to reiterate, and this is a slide that I always put in my presentation that you know if you your diagnosis is very clear cut, don't get an ultrasound just for the sake of it. Um, use your clinical gestalt, use your physical examination, and use ultrasound as an extension of your physical examination. Um, this, this is a great slide that I really like to talk about. Uh, what is the role of point of care ultrasound in patients with shock? So this was published in 2004, so 16 years ago, um, when uh, uh, Dr. Jones and group looked at all the patients who came to the ED with non-traumatic, undifferentiated shock. And you can see the two groups right here. Uh, the, this group had early focus, so they got a focus as soon as the patient uh, rolled in, and this patient, they had a delayed focus. And at 15 minutes, they asked a physician, hey, can you tell me like what are the differential diagnosis? And the, the, the most important thing is you can see the number, the mean number of differential diagnosis here was nine. So in a patient who did not have a focus, the differential diagnosis of the reason the patient is presenting was nine compared to four. A very important point. It was not zero. It was not one. It was four. So you will narrow down your differential diagnosis and increase the diagnostic accuracy. So again, like, you know, with, uh, this just tells me that focus is an extension of our physical examination. With this in mind, uh, you know, and another important point, there are a lot of, like, you know, if you look online, there will be a lot and lot of protocols that will guide you how to use point of care ultrasound or echo in assessment of shock. What I've realized is most of those um protocols are very sensitive so it's great that you know if you if you do the examination and you find a certain finding there's a high possibility that the patient may have it but there is also very low specificity so your examination is very sensitive with very low specificity in in critically ill patients i thought that there has to be a little bit more specificity to your examination just because you have more time if there is a patient who is having cardiac arrest and I put a probe, I will not use this protocol. I want to reach the diagnosis very quickly. I want to see if I can change the, the pathophysiology to reverse the cardiac arrest. But if I have an undifferentiated shock patient in front of me, I will complete this examination just to be very confident that I have thought about every possible cause of shock in the patient. And uh, like, you know, the diagnosis that I'm reaching is after ruling out other causes of shock that may be present that I might have not thought about in the patient. For example, uh, you know, there was a patient who recently came to our ICU with COVID. Right now, every patient has go, uh, like, you know, it's coming to critical uh, ICU is uh, COVID unless proven otherwise. And everybody was convinced that there was an RV failure. And we did an echo and there was an RV failure, but we stopped at that. The, 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 the most important thing was that the patient had RV failure because of LV failure and the patient ended up going to ECMO. So again, if you don't think about it, um, you will like, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So this protocol just makes you think that, hey, like, you know, even if I find a diagnosis that I think fits the patient, I will just make sure there is nothing else that I was not thinking um, that I have ruled out at least. So that's why the protocol looks a little bit, uh, it's like, you know, the too many boxes, but trust me, it's not that difficult. So like before we talk about point of color ultrasound, I think like this is for any ultrasound that you're doing. One view is no view. Um, you are imagining a three-dimensional structure uh, in the body and you are using a two-dimensional imaging uh, modality. So if you look at just one view and make a diagnosis, most of the times your diagnosis will be wrong. It's make, make sure you get multiple views of the structure from different uh, sections to be sure that you are putting together a lot of 2D images to make a 3D interpretation of that structure. So very important, one view is no view. 
This is another card that we made for our fellows and staff who are performing point of care ultrasound, just telling them what constitutes a basic uh, critical get echo. Uh, it's very simple. It's just plain views, your plaque view, uh, your plaques, which is the parastandard long axis, short axis, your apical four, five, and subcostal views. Very basic views that we highly recommend uh, anybody who is doing a point of care ultrasound in a shock patient to get. And also we told like, you know, this is just a small uh, suggestion that in every view, these are, the uh, these are the pathologies that you should be looking at. For example, in this view, just make sure you think about pericardial effusion, you think about tamponade, uh, if there is any systolic dysfunction that this patient might have or uh, uh, aortic dissection. Similarly, this is a card that every fellow has here just to go over all the differential diagnosis or all the diagnosis that they should be looking at each view. Uh, so let's start with the, the protocol. Again, very simple. You have a patient with shock. You can enter it in any ways. You can start with uh, assessing pericardial effusion, move to right ventricle or move to left ventricle, or you go and go the other way as well. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is a very good exercise that you do. You know, like, uh, you know, you feel that the left ventricle is the problem. Start with left ventricle, make sure you look at everything, but also come back and look at the right ventricle and the pericardial effusion. There have been cases where we have thought about one condition. I remember like few years ago when I started writing this protocol, there was a patient who, who had a, a blood culture positive uh, and everybody was concerned that this patient has a urinary tract infection um, and developed ARDS from that, just looking at the X-ray and everything. And when I was doing uh, the echo on that patient, I ended up finding that this patient had endocarditis with the mitral valve and the whole diagnosis and the management changed. And just because I was thinking about it, if we don't think about it, we will not look for it. So before we go to the pericardial effusion part, so you have a shock. I think pericardial effusion is an easier way to start it. What you should be looking at is that if the patient has pericardial effusion, a very important point to recognize is that, you know, how do you differentiate pericardial effusion from pleural effusion? Can be a little bit tricky. You can see this patient, there is a fluid right here and there is a fluid right here. So how do you know which one is pericardial effusion, which one is pleural effusion? The structure you should be uh, paying attention to is your descending aorta, which is right here. You know, it's marked with the red dot here. Any fluid that goes in front of the descending aorta is your pericardial effusion. Any fluid that is going behind the descending aorta is your pleural effusion, or uh, to be specific, left side of pleural effusion. Very important to differentiate these two as the therapy or the, the management that you will be doing will be different. Again, going back to that image, um, let's just. Now you can see here, this is your descending aorta right here, and the fluid is tracking in front of it. So that makes you your pleural effusion. There is a peri. Uh, uh, pericardial effusion, there is a pleural effusion right here, which is kind of going behind the descending aorta. This patient does not have a per, uh, pericardial effusion, it's just left sided pleural effusion as it tracks below the descending aorta. Now, this is pristine images, but in uh, in a critically ill patient, sometimes you may not, not have one view and you might get another view. Again, this is a patient who has both pleural effusion and pericardial effusion. You can see the pericardial effusion right here. Uh, denoted by the blue uh, field and the green field is your left-sided pleural effusion. An important point to note that we are like, you know, point of care ultrasound is very good when it comes to diagnosing pericardial effusion. So if you're using it for pericardial effusion with a little bit of training, you will be able to detect more than 95% when we compare it to the comprehensive echo. So that's a very good examination to do or when you start learning how to perform uh, ultrasound. Again, you know, we just, just just try to differentiate that if you have a patient who has trace fluid, uh, which is usually less than one centimeter, the distance between the visceral and pericardial effusion, most of the time that will not be causing shock in your patient. Uh, you can see here, this is like one 1.56 centimeter and 1.14 centimeter. That patient, I will just make sure that there is no signs of tamponade. Um, again, this, this is the easiest way. I remember it less than one centimeter is, don't worry about it. It can be a problem in patients with trauma or in patient post-surgical where a loculated effusion may cause shock in your patient, which may be small and just not seen very well with the transthoracic echo. 
but again most of the times if your fluid is less than one centimeter maybe just uh, um, you know you can be safe that that should not be causing tamponade in your patient again if it is more than one centimeter and definitely more than 22 centimeter make sure that you continue with the protocol and see if there is any signs of tamponade um, again you have your trace effusion here uh, you can continue with the protocol but if you have a uh, moderate to large effusion you have to look for signs of tamponade now it's you know there are a lot of fancy things that we can talk about when we are trying to diagnose tamponade physiology in a patient but again we are going to talk about basically what can we do at bedside with the point of care ultrasound with limited training that can help us diagnose tamponade physiology it's a clinical diagnosis your patient has to be in shock for you to be using this uh, protocol the easiest thing that we can look at is just looking at your IVC right here. If your IVC is small and collapsing, the chances of you having a tamponade is extremely low. And this is the, the citation that you can refer to that showed that, um, you know, if, if the patient has a small IVC with collapsing, that there is a, like very small possibility of having a tamponade. But if you have an IVC that is big and has minimal respiratory variation, it is a very sensitive test but not a specific test. The reason being there are multiple things that can cause you to have an IVC that is dilated, be it heart failure, be it a lot of volume in the patient. So this is a good place to start after you look for a pericardial effusion. Just make sure that do you have to go forward with the protocol or can you stop here? Next thing that like, you know, you have to look at is your chamber collapse. Now this is, um, this is easier said than done. Uh, practically just because most of the times if the patient is in tamponade, you will have the back stripe, they will be hypotensive and they will be tachycardic. And once the heart crosses 120, imagine it is a challenge. But again, this is what you need to confirm the diagnosis. Um, as the pericardial pressure starts rising, you will start seeing that, you know, RA being the, pre uh, the chamber with the lowest pressure will start inverting itself followed by a collapse. Um, the RA collapse, if you're seeing RA collapse, it's 92% sensitive, but not specific when it comes to diagnosing tamponade. But if your RA free wall is inverted for more than one third of the cardiac cycle, that is very sensitive and very specific. So this is always the first thing that I try to look for. If I can, first of all, find if it, the RA is inverting and if I can, I can denote, uh, I can figure out if it is in, uh, inverting for more than one third of the cardiac cycle. The best way to look at it is trying to see if you can get a good image, um, maybe zoom in a little bit. The views that I usually preferred for this is an apical post chamber view or a subcostal view where I can see the RA the best. And I can I always try to slow it down and try to just play it very uh, at a 25% normal speed to see if I can figure out when the RA is collapsing and how long it is staying collapsed or inverted. One thing that really helps is the M mode. And I will show you how. So you can see, again, the patient is very tachycardic. You are seeing some signs of RA inversion. It's not collapsing completely, but it is definitely inverting. And you can see a pericardial effusion. Now in this patient, I want to figure out when the, card, the chamber is collapsing and how long it is staying collapsed. You can see we put an M mode through that, through the free, the RA free wall. And if you can have an EKG, so there is one condition where I love to have an EKG. When I'm doing an echo, it's tamponade physiology, just because the, the it's so important to know what cycle of uh, what cardiac cycle are you in to be able to diagnose it accurately. So you can see an EKG right here. This is your QRS. This is another QRS. And what you're trying to figure out is like during that QRS, how long was my free wall inverted? In this patient, you can see it's almost half of the cardiac cycle. So if you put an M mode, you can slow it down enough to be able to appreciate how if the RA is collapsing and how long is it collapsing. So in this case, it's almost half. That makes me very confident that this patient has tamponade physiology. Another thing we can look at is an RV early diastolic collapse. Again, not as sensitive, but very specific. The reason being the RV pressure is higher than the RA pressure. So the, by the time you start uh, uh, collapsing the RV, the pericardial pressure has gone significantly higher. Uh, this is a more um, a severe form of tamponade physiology. Again, the same thing you can do, try to uh, see if you can get an M mode through the RV free wall, have an EKG. If 
if possible. And I will talk about how we can also use non EKG to help us know with what time of the what time of the cardiac cycle is the collapse happening. And you can see in an M mode, you can see very clearly that the RV is collapsing. This image is from the internet, so it's not mine. Uh, just uh, for the conflict part. This is a beautiful image that I really like. It's from uh, by Ultrasound Jelly that I always try to talk about when I'm uh, teaching tamponade physiology is that looking at the IVC, it's big with less than 50% variation. That makes you very sensitive that there may be tamponade. And the other way you can do it is just lowering your image and looking at what part of the cardiac cycle is based on your mitral valve opening or closing. And you can see this is your systole because both the valves are closed and the RA collapse is happening. And this one where you're looking for an RV a uh, chamber inversion or collapse, your walls are open, suggesting this is the diastolic phase, and that's when the collapse is happening. So you can look at the valves to help you guide what phase of the cardiac cycle you are in to see if the chamber is collapse happening during that time or not. I'm not going to talk about mitral inflow variation because that's advanced echo. Uh, so again, like you know, the, the easiest thing you can do is play it slowly like this and uh, see when the chamber is collapsing. You can see the mitral valve is closed here and you are having a free wall chamber inversion. Gets me very concerned that this patient is having tamponade physiology. Again, slow it down, look at it frame by frame, look like try to figure out when the, so you can see here is a diastolic right here where the valves are open and you are seeing a little bit of inversion of the right ventricle. So use your M mode, use a uh, slow down analyze frame by frame to see if there is, uh, you can detect the chamber collapse and the cardiac cycle. Um, again, one caveat is a don't try to use it in patient with a very advanced pulmonary hypertension. Just because the right-sided pressure being so high, this is a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension. The RV is twice the size of the LV. You can see the RA is pretty huge. There is hypertrophy of the right ventricle suggesting it's chronic in nature. And you can see the pressure being on the right side is so high, there is no collapse happening. In those cases, you should look at the RA, LA free wall inversion because the chamber at this, in this condition, the chamber with the lowest pressure may be your LA and that's where the chamber collapse can be seen. The other thing you can always look at is the swinging heart, which is very characteristic of tamponade physiology. So you can see the, how the heart is floating in the fluid that gives you your uh, pulses alternance. So again, if you see that, you know, for a basic person or for a person who's doing basic echo, you should be concerned about tamponade in that patient. So just, uh, we'll go over it one more time. Uh, this is a patient, again, everybody can appreciate the, the uh, plural effusion right here. And hey, are you able to see my cursor or no? Sorry, I forgot to ask that question. Can you see? Okay, now you can see it, right? So you can yeah. see the yes, yeah. pericardial effusion right here. And this is your RA right here. And you can see a little, um, um, so let's see if we can play it. Um, and you can see the RA free wall is inverting. So this is very early tamponade physiology, but it's not swing collapse. Um, sorry. Oh, yeah. Display this and then use the pointer. And here you can see nicely that the RA LA free wall is collapsing, making you very concerned that there is tamponade physiology. And this is another image where you look at RV free wall collapsing during diastole. So this is just a progression of how the tamponade happens. You have your uh, plural uh, pericardial effusion causing a little bit of collapse, followed by uh, complete RA free wall inversion that stays for more than one third of cardiac cycle, followed by your RV free wall collapse. If you see this, uh, just diagnose it as tamponade and call uh, the person who may be doing the, the train in your patient. If no, or you're not confident that the findings are always go for an advanced echo. Sometimes in trauma patient, uh, you might be able to see a blood coagulum. This is a patient who came to us, uh, was uh, having shock. We were trying to figure out what, what was going on. This is a patient with end-stage renal disease and you can see that there was a blood coagulum in this patient. Uh, there was a reason of tamponade physiology. We have had similar patients where uh, a procedure has gone wrong and you can see blood coagulum. So trauma, post-procedure, sometimes in stage renal disease, you can see this finding. Uh, and you should be very concerned and maybe calling cardiothoracic surgery. 
for the sake of time, let's move to the RV part of it. So the views that I prefer for that is your uh, parasternal long axis, your parasternal short axis, your apicals and your subcostals. So here you can see where the RV can be seen. It's very close to the, to the probe, to the skin. And what you are seeing here is just RVOT, not the complete RV. RV is very difficult structure to imagine. It's, it's one place that you want to be sure that you're getting good views from different angles before you can keep, uh, make a different uh, make a, a assessment of the function. This is your RV. A little bit of RV here can be seen as well and um, RV and subcostal view. Before we move forward, one very important point is, you know, RV kind of is a semilinear structure that kind of wraps around the LV. So if this is your LV, the RV kind of wraps around like this. So any, at any point, you are just imagining a part of an RV. Uh, so in this image, you can see how um, just by moving the probe, I'm able to change the size of the RV. Sorry, oh, this was not playing. Okay, you can see the RV right here. And as I fan the probe, I can get different size of the RV. This is very important because based on how you cut it, you might have different assessment of the RV. Uh, so another view that I prefer to use a lot when I'm assessing RV is a focus view where you kind of go through the LV to look at an RV gives you a much better uh, assessment of your RV function. Uh, so you can see in this image, again, if you want to assess your right ventricles in these two views, um, this is your parasternal long axis. You try to see what is the size and compare the size to the uh, LVOT aortic outlet and your LA. If the size looks the same, it should be one third, one third, one third. Then usually the RV is not dilated. Again, you can, this is your RVOT. You see how much the cavity is getting obliterated. It will give you a good idea how the RV is functioning. Same thing here. You can um, assess the RV just by looking at the size comparison to LV. It should be less than one third the size of your LV, which appears here. It's moving nicely. You see the cavity is getting obliterated or getting, uh, there is change in the cavity size tells you that the RV is normal size and normal function. If it is, just continue, go to the LV. If it is not, like in this case, uh, everybody can appreciate, um, let me get the laser pointer again. You can see the RV right here. It's much bigger size than your LV. Similarly, when you compare this RV to the aortic, to the aorta or the LA, this appears bigger. And even the cavity appears that it's not obliterating. Same thing with here. You can appreciate that this is your RV. It's almost more than one, th one more than the size of your LV. Um, and even the function appears very reduced. This makes me very concerned if there is, the RV is a reason for shock in my patient. If you do see it, you know, again, you can always, depending on the time you have or the testing ability you have, you can decide if the RV is a problem of shock in my patient, or you can try to find other reasons uh, that can help you with the confirmation of pulmonary embolism as the cause. Again, and most of the times, if your RV is causing shock in your patient, you will see an IVC that will be, will be big and dilated that because the patient is in obstructive shock similar to uh, the tamponade physiology. Another thing that really helps us is looking at the septum. Now, this is a very easy test to do. Everybody knows about the D-shaped LV. So again, when does the LV become D-shaped will tell you what kind of problem the RV is facing. If you see, and I can slow it down just to show you when it's happening. Oh, give me one second. So you, again, you can slow it down. You have an EKG right below. This is your this is your systole. You can see in systole it's nice and donut shaped. And as you move forward during the diastole, you can see how it becomes a D shaped. Um, again, like you know, we'll go another one. You can see how it becomes a D shaped. The RV is huge. Again, it should be somewhere this size, and it's like twice the size of your LV. And the the septum is deviated towards the LV during your cyst uh, during your diastole that tells me a pressure overload condition. This is usually seen in patients who have acute RV afterload problem. So if you see a dilated IVC and D-shape, 
you can either go look for a dvt which is very easy to do and if you do find a dvt then you are very confident that pulmonary embolism is playing a role if no just remember patient can have an rv in fact in those cases you look for an ekg or a decompensated ph i've seen ards causing similar findings to pulmonary embolism both of them are in a condition of acute rv afterload so again you can look for a mcconnell sign uh, can everybody appreciate the mcconnell sign right here so what happens in mcconnell sign is that this is the rv free wall it doesn't move much and this part which is kind of tethered to the lv just is being pulled inside because of the lv being hyperdynamic given that there is not enough blood that the heart is pushing out making the sympathetic drive cause a uh, hyperdynamic lv this is very sensitive for pulmonary embolism again if you see a mcconnell sign and you can look at a dvt that will make me very confirm that there is a pulmonary embolism causing rv failure as a shock the specificity of the study was low just because it was looking if mcconnell sign can tell me if there is pulmonary embolism not if the patient is in shock any patient with pulmonary embolism they looked at it i feel that if this study mcconnell sign is very indicative of pulmonary embolism if your patient is in shock just because then the rv is really failing and the mcconnell sign will be more prominent um the the way you can always confirm it is like everybody can appreciate this clot in transit right here if you see a clot in transit with a failing rv you are convinced that it's a clot that's causing it similarly this is a patient uh, with a dvt scan we are uh, ex uh, examining the left common femoral at the saphenous intake very common place for us to develop dvt and you can see a big clot right here do a compression uh, it was so clear we did not do compression on this patient but again you can compress it and confirm that uh, this patient has a uh, dvt again if you find all these things i think there is enough convincing evidence that the patient has pulmonary embolism you can decide what interventions to do um and if you find that the rv is normal you just move to the left side now left side is where most of the problem arises from uh in uh, in patients who are coming with shock uh as you can see this is a case of hyperdynamic lv uh when whenever it starts playing this is a patient with normal left ventricle systolic function and you can appreciate this patient has very poor lv systolic function both in long axis and short axis you can see it's moving it's kind of floating in the fluid that's called transitional movement but if you just look at the cavity that's what we should be paying attention to there is no cavity obliteration neither here nor here so that is a patient whose systolic function is decreased uh and both of them you have to be mindful of certain things so if you see a patient whose uh, systolic function is decreased the way i grade it is like you know if you uh, the the method that we recommend to all our fellows and trainees is that you don't have to measure anything eyeball examination is as good as uh measuring it with a comprehensive echo using advanced technology as long as you have done enough of them now in this image it becomes very clear that the the function is very reduced so if you have an ef by eyeball estimation to be less than 30 i will be highly likely that this may be contributing to the shock in this patient if it's more than 45 most likely it's not playing a role in the shock of the patient it's never say never but this is kind of like arbitrary uh that if you have an ef less than 30% i will be concerned like the, either the the complete shock or part of it is happening because of the reduced ejection fraction when you do have a person uh, who has reduced just make sure you're looking for regional wall motion abnormality that is very important um just because it will help you know what kind of a uh, cause is causing the ejection fraction to be low in this patient though it's like you know a little bit advanced but you can see i don't see a clear regional wall motion abnormality this patient had alcoholic uh, cardiomyopathy from what i remember but this is another case um and you can see this patient also has reduced ejection fraction but is may able to move the inferior lateral wall it's the anterior septal wall that is not moving again a very classic example of led um uh, what do you say acute mi being the cause of cardiogenic shock in this patient so when you are assessing a patient who has reduced ef just make sure you look for regional wall motion abnormality um and if there is significant um uh, you will be doing an ekg and troponins and you may we will be calling the right person for that uh, you can always look at the b lines right here 
that will just guide you if the patient is in cardiogenic shock or not. That's like just part of the complete workup for both heart lung to know if the shock and respiratory failure is coming from the from the uh, from the heart. So that's for the low. That's where we stop. That's where we recommend getting more advanced imaging or echo. Um, you know, for the patient when you see reduced EF. Um, this is where most of the money lies when there is a critically ill patient coming to our ICU is most of the times the LV will be normal or hyperdynamic. Everybody can appreciate the cavity obliteration, what we call the kissing uh, ventricles. This patient is very hyperdynamic and this is the IVC of the patient. It's completely uh, absent, should I say, you know, like it's like 0.1 centimeter or something. So that will lead me to two things, you know, either the patient is having a distributive hypovolemic shock uh, uh, or the patient is having a hemorrhagic shock. The best way to differentiate between them is to see if the patient is bleeding or not. If there is a good concern for that the patient is bleeding or you have a source of bleeding, end of story. You know, you have diagnosed the cause of shock in this patient. If not, or if you are not convinced that the patient is uh, uh, bleeding from any side, then you think about a hypovolemic distributive shock. Now that's where the focus can be helpful. Um, you can see this is a patient who was in hemorrhagic shock when we did an ultrasound of the belly. Um, this is the, the liver right here. So this is the uh, the pouch of Morrison's pouch and you can see the echogenicity there. That was the reason for shock in this patient, a positive fast examination. And this is another patient where we we're looking for the cause of like, we were convinced that the patient is having bleeding. We just could not find the source of bleeding. Uh, and this is the kidney. It was like 10 times the size. It was just the patient was bleeding so much into the kidney uh, that the patient was in hemorrhagic shock. Again, use the point of a ultrasound to, to your help. Um, lung, chest, fast examination are very easy tests to learn and master and can help you figure out where the, the shock is coming from. So definitely if it's hemorrhagic, Hypovolemic, again, the point of cath ultrasound can be very helpful. Um, this is a patient where, you know, we did a lung ultrasound and you can see the lung is kind of right here. And this is a very complex pleural effusion, helped us diagnose the cause of uh, septic shock in this patient. Same way, this is a patient with uh, cirrhosis and you can see how very turbid appearing, um, highly echogenic fluid. When we diagnosed it, the patient was having an SPP. So again, use uh, ultrasound to figure out not only where the shock is coming from, but also like, can you find the source of the shock? A few things that I will definitely make sure that, you know, we see a lot and it's something that you have to get better at, just like looking at valvular problems. You know, then the valvular problems I feel is one of the easiest, like, you know, one of the commonest things that we miss just because we are not looking for it. This is a patient uh, who came in, we were looking for cause of shock everywhere. The patient is always hyperdynamic just because they're having a cardiac origin of shock. And you can see the mitral valve, uh, aortic valve right here. Um, just looking at it, you know, we don't recommend any Doppler or anything when you are doing a basic echo, just looking at it. And when you look at it closely, you can see there is no coaptation. The valve are just moving up and down. And I don't even need a color there. If I see this image, no color, I will be very concerned that this patient is having an aortic regurgitation. And if the patient is in shock, this is my primary thing that this is causing shock in the patient. So again, if you are having a normal or uh, hyperdynamic LV, just make sure you rule out severe valvular regurgitation, especially of the left side, because that may be causing profound shock and that can be easily missed. So if you don't think about it, you will not find it. This is another patient who came to us with a shock and you can see this is a, this is your right ventricle, right atrium. This is a, your tricuspid valve completely damaged by the endocarditis. Usually the left-sided, uh, right-sided uh, vegetation or valve destruction should not cause shock, but this patient also had infective endocarditis causing shock in this patient. So again, just make sure that you look at the valves in two, two or three views to be sure that they are not the problem of shock. They're not the cause of shock in your patient. Again, um, uh, so this, this is a patient that I was talking, uh, referring to you before, um, is uh, like, you know, this is a patient where everybody was convinced that this patient has um, ARDS 
and you can see the left ventricle looks good but if you pay close attention to the mitral valve right here just keep playing a very close attention to the mitral valve right here you will see that it just looks a little bit off you know it just looked a little bit thick and so this patient had very bad uh, mitral valve endocarditis uh, sorry this slide is not playing appropriately as i planned and then um, when you put color, you can see a huge mitral regur uh, aortic regurgitation. There is some mitral regurgitation, but this patient, I will be worried about the aortic regurgitation being the cause of shock in this patient. Uh, something that I don't personally see in the ICU a lot, but I'm pretty sure Matt has seen enough is in aortic dissection. This is the false flap that you can see. Um, this is an RVOT, here's your aortic valve, and this is a dissection flap. Aortic dissection, if you don't think about it, you will never find it. Again, you have to go a little bit above the aortic valve. Um, um, I will not say like you can rule out aortic dissection with a transthoracic echo, but you can always find it once in a while if your patient presents with the uh, with appropriate history. Okay. Uh, next is um, a patient who has, a, everybody can appreciate this is uh, your left ventricle right here and your aort, uh, mitral valve and you can see a big vegetation right there. Again, you don't need to put a color. That patient is very classically diagnostic that this patient is having a mitral valve regurgitation that is causing a shock of this patient. This is another patient that was very, uh, you know, a nice find where we were concerned if the patient is having a, um, um, ARDS, but you can just appreciate how, let me just try to reframe it. You can see the anterior leaflet is going above, but the posterior leaflet is kind of falling into the left ventricle. Again, I don't need color for this. Even if I just have a 2D image that shows that this is not coapting, this is cardi uh, this patient has severe aortic, um, severe mitral regurgitation being the shock. Again, if you if you can see, I'm just going to fray, um, stop it at one point so you can appreciate it more. Yes, perfect. So you can see in this frame, there is too much color, very difficult to know whether regurgitation is happening. So this is called an eccentric jet of mitral regurgitation. And for anybody who's just learning how to do ultrasound, an eccentric jet is diagnostic, diagnostic that this patient has severe mitral regurgitation and cause of shock in your patient. So if you see a leaflet that's not co-apting, just assume that that is a cause of shock in your patient. Same thing you can appreciate here is uh, same thing. You can see how this is kind of prolapsing into your left atrium, and this gap is going to cause a severe regurgitation. Um, one thing that I have started seeing more and more uh, in our critically ill patients, especially with the patients who have septic shock, is something we call a uh, uh, SAM physiology. And you can see right here, this uh, the, if you just appreciate the left ventricle function, it's very hyperdynamic really hyperdynamic LV. And in those cases, just make sure that you look for uh, you look for uh, LVOT obstruction with a SAM or midventricular obstruction. We are seeing a lot of that in our ICU patients, especially our liver patient being a cause of shock. And you can see how the leaflets are being drawn into the LVOT, causing an obstructive kind of shock because this valve prevents the blood from flowing from the left ventricle into the aorta. A very easy things to fix you don't need to do anything. All you have to make sure is that you give them enough fluids and change the vasopressors from a levofed to phenylephrine or epinephrine to phenylephrine, and that should solve most of the problem. But an easy condition to miss just because you think the patient is uh, having a septic shock, well, there was uh, an obstructive cause of it. And again, I will try to slow it down so you can appreciate where it's happening. So again, these patients are so hyperdynamic. And you can see up right here, this, this is how mid-ventricular obstruction happens during systole. The ventricle just collapses on itself, causing the patient to be uh, going into shock. And this patient also had a SAM physiology. Again, difficult, very difficult to diagnose. You just have to um, think about it and just lower the images down as much as possible to be able to uh, look for that SAM physiology. But trust me, if you look enough, you will find that there is a decent amount of patient population who have SAM. This is a good image uh, that tries to show what happens in SAM. Again, during uh, during left ventricle systole, the leaflet should be closed and come somewhere here. 
what happens is the blood because alveoli cavity is small the blood going from the lv kind of pushes on the leaflet and kind of drags it into the alveoli causing an obstructive type of shock the best way to diagnose is you put a continuous wave and you see what we call a dragger shape uh, waveform again we'll end with the lung ultrasound um you know definitely don't think, uh, don't miss the pneumothorax we do see enough of pneumothorax um lung ultrasound uh, is a very easy um skill to attain with minimal training compared to echo and you can see when you put a lung ultrasound you look for lung sliding um and you can see that there is no lung sliding it gives you a shimmering appearance um uh when the pleura visceral pleura is sliding on the parietal pleura you see a shimmering appearance uh this is my preferred probe when it comes to looking at pneumothorax or lung sliding your linear probe that you use for dvt scan use the same probe and you will be able to see if there is lung sliding or not and the way you confirm it is you try to look at a lung point this is called the curtain sign where basically half of the lung where there is air so this you can, what you are seeing here is a parietal pleura the visceral pleura is separated from parietal pleura by air which the ultrasound cannot go across is the area where the parietal and visceral pleura is still together and you see that it's moving in and out with inspiration giving you what we call a curtain sign this is a lung point and where 100% diagnostic that there is a pneumothorax i think we are on time we have like 10 minutes left if there is any question that the group has i'm more than happy to answer Does anybody have any questions for Sid? I know we have uh, representatives from a lot of different departments here today. Um, if not, I just want to thank you, Sid, um, for presenting. That was an excellent, um, you know, overview of of bedside cardiac uh, echo and how you work through the uh, the thought process of the patient in shock. I found it was. Uh, very well organized, very well put together. And I think it'd be very helpful for those who, who are here today. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question to the group, you know, are you seeing a lot of like SAM or LVOT in your critically ill like ED patients? We we have been seeing a lot in our ICU patients recently. Maybe we started looking at it, but how like, you know, like, you know, especially in patients with hemorrhagic shock and all like, you know, profound hypovolemia. Uh, I can't comment towards our units, but I know from our perspective, we haven't been seeing it though. Um, it's a question always of, are you looking for it? Or are you seeing it? So um, I think it's certainly something that's very important to look for. I, there, there have been some cases that we've had where it's come across the differential um, and we've looked specifically and haven't seen it, um, you know, but it's, it's, um, it's definitely something to keep an eye out for. Yeah. I don't know, um, representatives from CICU, MICU, are you guys looking for it, seeing it? You have a rowdy bunch today here, Sid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, got to check the chat here. Um, a couple questions that came up in the chat here. Um, what move, let's see what movement is called translation. So Dan Livingston was asking a little bit about uh, translational movement. Uh, I, I think that you're referring, that was right about 20 minutes ago. So you're referring to something about the finding the L, the RV. Was that right, Dan? Or can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So I think severely reduced EF. He can't talk. Oh, with the <laughs> severely reduced EF trans, like you know, we. Yeah. So if you're talking about the translational movement, we do see it a lot. Actually, um, I should not say a lot. We do see it often, and it throws people away just because the movement of the heart is like we are so in tune to heart just moving. Uh, that we call the function looks appears normal. And I keep reiterating that look at the cavity size. So especially if there's a patient where uh, pericardial effusion is small, small, you do see a lot of translational movement uh, that happens uh, in patient even when the EF is reduced. The reason I went back to this uh, image is because if I just like ask somebody, how does the function look, they might call it moderate, you know, sometimes moderately reduced, but it's severely reduced just like, 
So if you, I, if I play this video, you will appreciate it. Like you know the the LV is kind of moving, but if you look at the cavity, the cavity is not getting obliterated. So that's the thing that you have to pay very close attention. That this movement, uh, especially on the LV or the RV side, may throw you off when you're interpreting with an eyeball. So make sure that you don't look at just how the ball is moving, but how the cavity is coming together. The best way to remember this is like usually what I do is. Uh, I put a pointer here and ask like how everything is coming towards the pointer. When I put a pointer, you can see the walls are not coming towards the pointer. So that gives a better assessment of the function. I hope that answers your question. Now, how commonly do you see McConnell sign associated with other con conditions? So that's a great question. So I have like, you know, with, during COVID times, we did a lot of echoes on the patient just because we wanted to reduce the amount of formal echo being done. And we did see a significant amount of McConnell sign in patient with ARDS. Again, I think it's a more of a marker of uh, acute RV afterload rather than pulmonary embolism. Uh, since the, uh, the echo is not super uh, used in ARDS, we are still, we just started doing it, but we have been doing echo for PE a lot more. We have just associated McConnell sign with PE, but I think it's more of a marker of acute RV afterload increase. Yeah, the, the takeaway that I had while you're talking about that um, is I think this, among other things, it really depends on what patient subset you're talking about. I mean, here in our context, we're talking about patients in shock. And so you have someone who is acutely uh, decompensated. And so when you see McConnell sign in that setting, you know, that's going to point you towards the PE. Um, mm -hmm. But if we talk all comers and, you know, um, who weren't in shock or and had many other conditions, I think if you try to apply that test, um, I think it probably wouldn't perform as well. I mean, I think some literature bears that out with some of the sensitivity um, numbers in, in other studies aren't quite as high as 100%. Um, and so I think you're right in saying that there's some afterload effect um, yeah. that's, that's causing it, not, not just the fact that there's a, an embolus there. I don't know, does that yeah. sound fair, Sid? Or? No, no, that, that is perfectly said. The best it, way to explain why McConnell's sign happens is just because the, the afterload has gone up the RV takes more time to contract compared to LV. So your RV, LV, your RV is still contracting when the LV starts relaxing, giving you that McConnell kind of pattern to the small segment that is still attached to the to the LV. Um, again, so the so the question was about the dragger sign again on M mode. So yeah, sorry, I did not include the M mode image here just because I wanted to keep it image and uh, only that things. But yes. Um, one of the things that really helps in a, a patient with uh, with shock where the cardiac is the source is that the patient will always be tachycardic. And as I showed you in this image, this image is a very classic example of uh, SLAM physiology. And still it's very challenging to see. So what you can do is you can put an M mode through this right here. And what you will see is that a part of the mitral leaflet will be touching uh, the, the septum. Um, is it possible to get an image from uh, from internet here? Share it just so everybody can see it. Um, yeah, your screen is shared. So yeah, I did not put that image here. So the question becomes this dragger shape. So this dragger shape happens because what is happening is this is the start of your systole and your, your LV is contracting, you're pushing blood, 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 till it, the, and the pressure keeps going up till the obstruction happens and suddenly there is a cutoff of blood supply. And that's why it gives you a kind of a dragger shape, you know? So like the flow will be like this till the obstruction happens, which happens mostly during mid systole, and then you will have a straight line from there. Does that answer your question? And this is this is your continuous wave. This is not your M mode. M mode will, when you put an M mode through this, what you will see is that the septum is attached to the, uh, this leaflet is attached to the septum uh, during uh, systole when it should not be. 